First of all, I've been very stuck for a long time. Um, economics isn't working, politics isn't working, our relationship with creation, uh, with the ecosystem isn't working. Um, but I've been very stuck as to um, how we might progress that. If you like, I've been very intellectually and emotionally constipated. Um, <laughs> a lot of composting has been going on, so... <laughs> New Frontiers certainly loosens up a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> so this is going to be kind of free-flowing for the next... <laughs> <laughs> Enough of this. Um, let me start with a little um, plug. Um, but actually, this is a, a nano story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, it just kind of, <laughs> anyway, this is, a <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to get through these 20 minutes. This is a, a, an absolute nano story um, about a whole bunch of things. So these are some uh, New Zealand school kids. Remarkably, very few children in New Zealand cycle to school. Um, it's because their parents drive them in SUVs, streets are considered too dangerous for them to cycle on, even pavements are. Schools are very risk averse. Um, these are really lucky kids because um, they've been the benefit of um, this man who's so humble it's hard to find a photo of him. So this is Paul McArdle in the Hawke's Bay who came home from, he and his wife came home from 10 years overseas in Holland where of course a lot, everybody cycles um, and wondered why kids weren't cycling. So he developed a program to build um, cycle tracks like this inside schools. Um, so to give kids the confidence and the skills to ride. Um, at um, our Kinder Foundation that I've um, had been involved in from the start, the organization back in 2008, until um, it achieved a complexity that I was incapable of exercising any governance over, which I very gratefully retired and handed over to anarchy. <laughs> um, we um, helped um, Paul develop bikes in schools. And um, this coincides, my next point, with another enterprise, social enterprise we helped get going, which was the Tour of New Zealand Cycle Race. And... Um, Team Arkana um, has taken part in the three tours so far. The fourth one's coming up first week of April this year. And um, this is the team at Cape Rienga at the start of the race two years ago. Um, I'm organizing two teams for the South Island. Um, you don't have to be a fantastic racer. Um, it's not about that. Um, it's about doing things like raising money for bikes in schools. Um, and um, I'm still a few riders short for the two teams. So if anybody feels like cycling on average 100 kilometers a day um, up the South Island um, and um, with um, a fabulous peloton party every night, um, and then meeting the riders from the North Island for criterion races in front of Parliament, a treacherous little 600-metre course around the steps of Parliament and down the zigzag drive and up Molesworth Street and back in the top end. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but it's about, of course, um, social enterprise. It's about community. It's about active transport. It's about um, confident, healthy kids. It's a micro story about this, about how we reimagine cities um, and therefore try and find a bit of hope in the Anthropocene. Um, this is now officially, according to the geologists, the human epoch, where we and our activity, we humans, um, are the greatest driver of planetary change. So, of course, it's... Um, and you saw this chart earlier, the Stockholm Resilience um, Center's work, um, it is about, um, um, crucially, the biggest overshoot of planetary boundaries is the biochemical flows, and that's how we grow food. Um, and so that's right this, to, to hear what Severin's got to say and all the other things we've been hearing about food. And, of course, related intimately with that is the biosphere integrity there, at 11 o'clock, um, and our uh, very desperate loss of genetic um, diversity. And um, the only answer to this is completely radical. So this is a, an American writer from two, a uh, couple of years ago, Roy Scranton's book. Sorry, it's really 
can you all read that from no or is it fantastic because I, I hate it when people read other people's words I just let them you read them yourself When I first read that, I thought, man, uh, I, I'm really scared that the civilization's already dead. But then I originally uh, came around to thinking, well, how exciting. You don't often get to um, build a new civilization, so let's get on with it. Um, so this is about cities, um, and it's about the rapid rise of cities. So around about 2007, 2008, we crossed an important threshold that um, uh, for the first time in human history that more than half of people lived in cities. Um, but that's escalating very rapidly. And um, it has enormous uh, economic and technical benefits. So if you just look at the 40 mega regions of the world, um, they are responsible for um, an amazing amount of um, economic activity. Um, and uh, by far the greatest outgrowth of um, science and technology as well. Um, and of course, um, problems happen. So that's a picture of Shanghai on the left most days, and occasionally it looks like that on the right. Uh, and um, yeah, that's the measure of what happens just in those 40 mega regions of the world. Um, at that threshold in 2007, 2008, um, at the Tate Modern in London held a fabulous exhibition about it. And um, I took these photos, which speak for themselves about um, the sort of impact um, cities have um, on the planet. But it also posed these two incredibly important questions uh, about how we organize ourselves. So this is population density um, in the left hand um, picture that flat little pancake on the right hand side is London um, and then the big um, ant heap behind is Mumbai. On the right hand side you can see that's grown 1,180% in a very short time. So how we um, imagine and then design and build and run and manage ourselves and our cities is really important. So here are the two big questions. Can cities be improved by design? And in many ways, far more importantly, can cities promote social justice and greater equality? So do we want to go um, heading, screaming off down to the planet of slums, or do we want to be international curators? This is um, a picture from Sao Paulo. <laughs> and I don't know whether Sharon Lucas recognized this, um, how it turns out in many cities. A lucky few have Babylonian hanging gardens and tennis courts and swimming pools, and then there's the rest. Cities are also important because of what they do to us, positively and negatively. This is a wonderful thought, and again, I'll leave you to read it, um, from Lewis Mumford, um, the American um, sociologist. So we know that our cities are brutalizing us, um, and that's um, the conditioning of the mind that's um, going on. Trying to understand this a bit better, I went walkabout September of 2015. I went only to Beijing, London, and Chicago over those that month interviewing people. Um, not a cross-section of cities in the world, but it's places where I could stay for free knowing people. Um, and. Um, also, I've got long history in the three cities, um, and although I've never lived in Beijing, but I first visited in 1979, so it was also a chance to reflect, and that's um, the result of that was a book published, little BWB text that Mark mentioned, Three Cities Seeking Hope in the Anthropocene, that I, uh, BWB, Bridget Williams' books, published last September. Um, when it turned up on Kindle, um, I was so proud and... Um, when I met up with my Saturday morning cycling group, we were kind of standing around, ready to cycle. I said, oh, my book's on Kindle, and it says it takes two hours to read. So I said, it's kind of a book or a rugby game. And they all looked at each other and said, who's playing? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is um, an incredibly um, beautiful cultural center in Beijing. 
given by the people of Holland. Um, and so that's not to say that China isn't incapable of imagining. And one of the very strong themes going on in China is this quite extraordinary phase, phrase, eco-civilization. Um, and it's China trying to imagine how to solve its great um, ecological and economic and social issues by reaching deeply, deeply back into its culture. And um, I was bowled over by that phrase. I hadn't seen any reference to it in English. Um, and um, the back of the book, I could offer now some references. Um, and I was hearing about this from really senior people who are trying to make this happen in China. Um, and it's turning up in the current five-year plan, for example. There are projects around eco-civilization. Um, massively ways to go because essentially people are in Beijing were telling me, well, we're kind of still building cities the way we were. So it seems to me fundamentally important that we can't get this right in terms about um, what cities do to us and for us and what we do for the planet if so many people are going to be living in cities. We're heading to 80% of the human population living in cities, 90% in Latin America. Um, that we've got to bring nature back into the city. And I don't mean in a manicured way like parks and back gardens or window boxes. Um, but finding ways to make cities largely self-sufficient for energy, food, and other resources. And that, of course, is in no way to undercut what goes on outside the city, but about connecting the two. Um, um, and the great role of um, that deeply restorative um, restoring of the landscape and the ecosystem uh, as we produce food, um, as Severin outlined. So then these also have to be places which are delightful and inspiring. Um, because then those 80% of people um, who live in cities are deeply reconnected with recreation. Reconnected for many of them, it'll be for the first time. You know, I grew up um, in a big industrial city in England. Auckland's the smallest city I've ever lived in. Um, and um, nature was something that was deeply manicured in the city. And we would go off to the mountains or the coast for um, wildness, for nature. Well, that's completely crazy. I want my wildness in the city. Um, there are some technology pathways. Uh, biomimicry is one. Uh, people like Janine Benyus in the United States. Um, and this is where we borrow and barely adapt um, technology from nature. The old joke that nature's been doing R&D for four and a half billion years, it knows some stuff. Um, a couple of examples from this slide at the top. That's um, an office building in Harare in Zimbabwe. Um, Zimbabwe is pretty high up, so it's hot during the day and it's cold at night. Um, but that's a modern office building with no um, artificial heating or cooling. Um, so that the ventilation system is based on the ventilation system of an ant heap. Um, and so if you can heat and cool in Harare with extreme temperatures without mechanical sorry, there's a little bit of fans blowing some stuff around, but not much, then what else do we do? And then there's wonderful things like self-cleaning surfaces um, that borrow um, a nanoscale from the surface of a lily pad. Have you ever seen a dirty lily pad? Yeah. Wonderful self-cleaning. It goes on like that. I don't know what to make of cellular agriculture at all or aeroponics. Part of me says, crikey, 10 billion people need to feed well, eat well, even if we stop wasting food. But look at a mess we're making the ecosystem, the way we make food. Maybe there's something in this because this apparently has zero environmental impact. But deep down, I can't believe if you grow some hamburger meat from meat stem cells, that all the nutrition that we barely understand is there. Moo-free milk is based on a, a vague simulcrum of real milk. How can it possibly have um, all the deep, deep nutrition um, of real milk? But how do we do milk that's fair to the cows and the land? So I really wrestle with this, um, um, and I don't know the answer. Um, in, in terms of looking for people who integrate these things, um, 
a person that many will be familiar with because Kate's got quite a following these days about is Kate Rayworth, um, a British economist who for many years was the co-editor of the United Nations Human Development Report every year. And when she worked for Oxfam one day, five or six years ago, she kind of leapt up and started drawing circles on a whiteboard and here are the two circles. Um, the outer circle is the most important one. That's the environmental ceiling. Those are the Stockholm Resilience Center's planetary boundaries. We can't breach those because if we do, we have no future. Oh, the planet will be fine. It'll morph into something else as it's done over four and a half billion years. But humans, as we are now, won't be around. Um, but to get that deeply profound scale of change, speed of change, and complexity of change, we've got to have communities where um, everybody is in on the journey. So uh, we have the courage to move faster, but the compassion to bring everybody along with us. We have to have um, a common sense, a common understanding of what needs to happen, common purpose about what we're going to do, and real common wealth about how that's shared. That only happens in communities with a social foundation, where, of course, it's food, water, income, education, gender equality, all of that. But between that floor, that wonderfully strong floor, and that absolutely unbreakable ceiling is the safe and just place for humanity, um, where inclusive and sustainable economic development can happen. Kate's got um, a big book about this um, coming out this year because it's going to completely overturn economics. And um, so I, she was one of the people I interviewed, and there's a bit of her in the book. So do watch out for Kate's book. Then there's the people. Think about some cities like Marseille, which is 30% Muslim and 70% Christian. I put Christian in inverted commas because some people wouldn't call themselves Christian but whatever. But um, Marseille is a very peaceful city compared, for example, with Paris, at the other end of France, which has the same, um, has a lower percentage of um, Muslim um, citizens. Or Kerala, the state in India, where pretty much equal mix of Christians, Muslims, and Hindus, and yet that state has India's best literacy, life expectancy, and healthcare. Or indeed, Queens, New York City, um, a borough that's bigger than Auckland, 2.3 million people, 138 languages spoken, uh, a crucible of creative diversity. So these are the observations of um, two Americans, uh, Karl Mayer and Shireen Blair Bryzak, in their books, in their book Pax Ethnica, that came out a few years ago. And they traveled the world to find these sane oases in a rabid world. So these are aces of, uh, oases of civility, where human ingenuity and determined statecraft had diffused potentially explosive civil conflicts. So um, as we go about this, there's an awful lot of fun that could be had. Um, John Berger, who sadly died at a great age just a few weeks ago, said this about cities. Every city has a sex and an age which has nothing to do with demography. Rome is feminine, so is Edessa. London is a teenager, an urchin, and in this hasn't changed since the time of Dickens. Paris, I believe, is a man in his 20s in love with an older woman. <laughs> um, I put this to people in Auckland, and the best answer I ever had was from one of my daughter's great friends, Catherine, who said that Auckland is a middle-aged, Pakiha semi-sober businessman. <laughs> There's work to do. But how does New Zealand contribute to this? This is what's happening, for example, in China. Jing Jing Ji brings together Beijing, Tianjin, and parts of Hebei province around it. An awful lot of people, very high density of people. Um, that's New Zealand by comparison. Um, and um, Jing Jing Ji would occupy about three quarters of the South Island. Um, it makes no sense that we have anything to contribute, but this is in Shenzhen. This is a wonderful um, Marisfrog uh, 
high-end ladies, fashion, wonderful designer. And this extraordinary building is being designed by Van Brandenburg, a, a, a architectural firm in Dunedin. Um, and pioneering um, architectural te uh, construction techniques which are, are right for local people in China. So the, there's some wonderful concrete stuff going on here. So the concrete's a problem. But the building's very inspirational. This was um, Auckland uh, shortly after Hobson planted the flag at Britomart Point in September 1840. Um, what a most extraordinary physical place um, with the two harbours and the bush and volcanoes. This is um, Tamaki Makoro today. Our ability to make this an extraordinary city um, as the same sort of opportunity that Wellington or Christchurch has means that I think we do have something to offer. Um, but it's probably more about the way we work and a lot of the cultural things rather than say, oh, well, we've got big cities too. You know, we know what it's like doing big cities. So what we've got to do is to make sure that everything we contribute in this, and this is why the global in impact visa is so important about bringing people here from places like Sao Paulo or Beijing or wherever, um, to be able to help support them in a different kind of way than they would in their own countries um, to tackle some of these issues. And we would be benefit hugely from it, of course. So, but we've got to do this in very distinctively New Zealand ways. In a fast, homogenizing world where one country, one culture looks ever more like another, our identity and what we can contribute to the world is really important. So this building is the first living building in New Zealand, a very um, demanding um, um, standard out of Seattle, where buildings are self-sufficient for energy and water. And um, it is dead right that this is Tuhoi who built this in the Uruwera. I'm going to let you read this because um, I don't think I can get the words out, but it's better you read them. This is Alan Kernow. In 1943, at the depths of the Second World War, and when we last saw fascism um, on the ascendancy, um, he wrote a poem celebrating the 300th anniversary of Tasman's Sail By of New Zealand. What, I love the Dutch, but how stupid not to get off the boat. <laughs> anyway. He sailed by. But what was going on there, innovation, and this is what Alan Kono's wonderful poem's about, is the innovation then was, heck, you just had to sail in a different direction from everybody else, and you'd bump into some new land. I mean, how hard was that? Well, actually, very hard. Um, but here is um, just a few lines from that poem, um, which I think is the challenge. Thank you.